cool all that God's doing here at New Life, and uh, one of the things he's doing right now is we're walking through the book of Philippians. And it's been really interesting as we've been studying this book that Paul wrote in the first century, kind of looking at, at really like what he's saying to this church. And one of the themes that has been really just strong throughout this letter is this idea where Paul is saying to this church, it doesn't really matter what God throws at you. You remain committed to him no matter what. It doesn't matter what this world might throw at you, that, that there's a commitment to Christ here that you see in the book that, that says, no matter what is thrown at me, I will remain faithful to him. And as I think specifically just kind of about this, the, the, the text this morning, so last week Paul was reflecting on his own life. And as he was reflecting on his own life, and really specifically the hardship that he was enduring in his own life, he, he said basically that my hope is more important than my life. And, and as he was reflecting on that, it really culminated in this verse that was so beautiful, verse 21, where Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But there's this commitment that Paul had that basically said, I am willing to endure anything for the gospel. And now as the letter moves forward, what Paul helps the reader see is that not only was this something that Paul himself was enduring, but he's saying to them and to us that, that as we walk with Christ, that we too can experience expect to experience hardship, that we too can expect to experience suffering and difficulty. And I think we could all probably agree that like, while that's true, and we probably know that on some level, that I don't know that anyone is like excited about that. I don't know that anyone like wants to sign up for that. And, and while I, I'm like really with you there, if we think about suffering, there's something about suffering and hardship that sometimes it's like, it's not as bad maybe as we think it would be. And we can look back on the other side and see like, there was actually maybe some good that came out of it. And I'll just use this, this example. That, so um, in the spring, what the staff did at New Life is we thought it'd be really fun to go to uh, Eagle Sky, which is where our kids go to camp. And so we wanted to go out there. I've never been out to the, camp, to the facility, so I wanted to check out the facility. We thought, hey, we'll we'll do some promo videos, we'll check out the facilities, and then maybe we'll kind of just get a feel for all the stuff they have, and then we'll have like a brainstorming session where we plan the fall that evening. So we're sitting there, we're at Eagle Sky, doing our camp thing, and, and they were like, hey, would you guys like to go on a cave tour? And I was like, that sounds awesome. Yeah, I'd love to go on a cave tour. So when they said cave tour, this is the, the vision that I had in my mind. Open mouth cave walk through on like a paved sidewalk. Guide tells jokes about stalactites and stalagmites. You know, like the, the, holding on tight to the ceiling and it might reach the ceiling, you know, science teacher jokes, that kind of stuff. And so that's kind of what I had in my mind. Then we, so we go to this cave and I'm like, where's the mouth of the cave? And then he's like, right there. And it's a hole like this big. And it's like, yep, you just gotta climb that 15 foot ladder down there and then you're in the cave. And that was the beginning. And so we're like, we're going through this cave and it was like really like intense. And just to kind of give you a picture of like what we endured, someone filmed a little bit of it. I just want you to see it. Um, like this is, this is footage of us as a staff going through the cave. <laughs> That's Cass Cassie wore that to lead worship the day before, just in case you're wondering. The reason why we have lights on our helmets is because that's the only way you could see down there. Yep. That's in the center of the world. I think this is where you realize that I'm a genius. Um, I took my shoes off. Okay? Here was my thought. If I take my shoes off and I hold them, my shoes won't get wet. Yeah. So I walked through a cave barefoot, my shoes got soaked, it did nothing for me, okay? And then I had to like hold everyone back to put my shoes back on. 
I'll never forget. Okay, I will never forget when the late, it was, it was actually the guy, was the, guy, the guy who was giving us the tour, he looks and he's like, I've never seen the water raise like this before. And then he looks at us and he says, guys, there's no way you're going to get through this without getting wet. And he was right. Now, okay, so like there's a part of that, like that was like, <laughs> Cass was like, uh, Cassidy was like, man, cool, I get to relive the, the worst day of my life three times today. Like that's what he said. There, so like there is that sense of like, man, that was like, that was horrible. Like that was so scary. And like, like I just, whatever. But there's also like this thing that we, as we went through it and we endured it, there was also this kind of cool sense of like accomplishment at the end. Like we got to the other side, we climb out that ladder, no one died, and we're like, man, we, we did that together. And it was really, it, was it hard? Yeah, it was. And part of what made it great was that it was hard. Like if we would have walked through just a normal cave with a side, like it, we wouldn't be talking about it. But now we're like, we're changed because of it. And what Paul is saying is as he, as he looks at this letter and as he tells the, the, the Philippian church, he's saying, hey, you need to expect a little bit of suffering. What he's saying to them is like, it's, it's, not, it's not the worst thing if you do. And the key verse here is verse 29. And this is where, this is what verse 29 says, where Paul, Paul's speaking to them. He says, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And again, like, this isn't something that we're like, yes! But it's part of it. And what we'll see this morning is that as we, as we suffer for him, as we suffer because of our relationship with him, we, we come to know Jesus better in the process when it happens. And so I want to give you three reasons why suffering isn't, isn't as bad as maybe you think it would be. And the first thing is, is that suffering, what suffering does, is suffering reveals our true citizenship. That suffering review, re- reveals our, our true citizenship. It reveals where we belong. It reveals where we place our hope, where we place our trust. And, and you see that here as, as the letter starts. Look at this in, in verse 27. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That that phrase there, manner of life, that in the Greek, that's only one word. And it's the word politomai. And and that comes from the, like, that's how we get the word politics. And every commentator that I read said that when the original reader reads that word, immediately what comes to their mind are thoughts of citizenship. And for, 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 like, the Philippians, citizenship is a defining factor of who they are. That, that, that a few decades prior to Paul writing this letter, there was a decisive battle that was fought, and, and the Philippians helped the Romans in that battle. And because they helped the Romans in that battle, the people of Philippi automatically became Roman citizens. And here's what we know. We know that, that in, in first century ancient Near East, like where this is happening, there are few things that are more important to a person than Roman citizenship. That pe- like Roman citizenship was something that everyone wanted, but only a few people had. The people who had this, this citizenship, they would walk around with an aura about them because they had something that everyone else couldn't get. That you, you see the value of Roman citizenship. Actually, you see it in Paul. That, that Paul's in prison right now. That Paul could be killed for what he did. But the reason why he hasn't been killed for what he did is because he's a Roman citizen. Because when they were getting ready to, to kill him, he said, oh, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar. And Roman citizens could appeal to Caesar. And here's, here's what he's saying. What Paul is saying to this church that values themselves, that their whole life has heard, it's so important to be Roman. One of the great things about being born in Philippi is that you get to be a Roman citizen. What Paul is saying to them is he's saying that 
there's a citizenship that's more important than being a Roman citizen. Amen. And it's a citizenship that is heaven. He's saying more than, more than the fact that you belong to Rome, you belong to Jesus. More than your priorities, that your ultimate allegiance, that all of those things that you've been told your whole life are the most important thing. There's actually something more important than, for you. And it's that you live your life in a manner worthy of Christ. Is that you live your life in a way that reveals that your true home isn't Rome, but it's heaven. And you actually see the force of that here in the verse. Look at, look at that. He says, he says, not only let your manner of life, he says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. He's saying, there is nothing more important than that you identify with your heavenly home. There is nothing more important for you than that you reveal to the world where your true citizenship lies. And for them, it would look like this, that, 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 in, that in that society, in that culture, what they would do is they would deify the emperor. They would make him feel almost godlike, and that part of being a Roman citizen was that you would offer sacrifices to this person, and as you'd offer sacrifices to this person, you would say, Caesar is Lord. And the thing is, if you're a citizen of heaven, you don't do that. You're not gonna, the only person that you're going to deify is Jesus Christ, and the only person that you're going to say is your Lord is Jesus Christ, is not Caesar. And what Paul's helping them see is, and the reason why that's the case is because that's not where you belong. You belong somewhere else. That that's where your hope is. And now for us, what that means is that means that we too should live in a way that reveals where our heart is. That that means that, that there are going to be moments in our life where, where we're going to have to be honest when it would be a lot easier to lie and it might bring on marginalization and maybe even a little bit of persecution in our life, but, but, but we have to do it because our citizenship is somewhere else. That means that sometimes for us, there are going to be moments where we'll be in conversations and the subject of the conversation is something where, where we have a choice, where we either have to, to stand up and say something else or walk away. And the reason why we do that is because we belong somewhere else. That it means that there will be moments where culture is going this way. And as followers of Jesus, we have to go this way. And, and here's the thing, that when that happens, we reveal where we belong. When that happens, inevitably, people will look down on you inevitably what will happen is people will say things about you. They'll think things about you. And what, what Paul is saying to the Philippians, he's saying, that's a good thing. And the reason why it's a good thing is because it reveals where you actually belong. That when you suffer for this, it, it proves that it's real. It proves that you actually belong somewhere else because at any moment you could stop living it. That's the beauty of suffering. That's why it can be good. Another reason why, why I would say that suffering helps us know Jesus better is that what suffering does is it creates unity. Like there's something about like suffering that creates unity with the people that we, that we suffer with. I mean, I go back to that fear bonding at the cave. <laughs> like, there, like our relationship it changed because we did that. Like, I, I will never walk by a cave and not think of Pastor Cassidy. I can't. <laughs> the, the, like, there was this unity that was created because of what we experienced. I even had a friend come out as my buddy T.J. Woodard. He lives, he's a pastor in Poplar Bluff. He's a real creative type. And I thought, hey, you know, we're going to do some brainstorming. I would love to have TJ part of that because he's really good at that type of thing. I didn't tell him about the cave. <laughs> and, and so he came out and uh, they, we did the cave tour and he didn't bring a change of clothes. And, 
And then after we were done with the cave, he had to actually leave because he was supposed to pray at a chamber of commerce event in his town. Right after he got out of the cave, someone had to meet him there. It was really bad for T.J. Woodard in that situation. But you know what it did? It brought us all together. <laughs> like, even like with T.J., like, there was a sense there was like, he didn't know anyone that was there. Like, he was just my friend who was tagging along. But because we all went through that together, like, there's, a, there's this level of just kind of closeness amongst us all. And, like, I can tell you guys the story, and it's like, oh, that's cool. Like, I, yeah, I kind of feel like I was there, maybe. But it, it's not the same as if you were. It's not the same as if you experienced it with us. And, and there's this, that's what happens through suffering. Is that what suffering does is it brings, it brings people together. And that's what, what Paul says. Look at this. He says, so he says the thing about letting your manner be, of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you, or I'm absent, that I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents. So if you notice there, Paul says, talks about standing firm in one spirit. And, and if you remember last week, we talked about how Paul, he, he thanked the, the church of Philippi for praying for them, for him. And he's like, thank you for praying for me because your prayers— I'm being strengthened by the spirit of Jesus Christ. It's sustaining me so that I, I, I expect that this will turn out for my deliverance and I, and I am confident that I will in no way be ashamed of the gospel. As they too are suffering, as they too are facing persecution, as they too are being marginalized like Paul and experiencing the same types of things he's experiencing, they too are experiencing the presence of the Spirit of God that Paul too experienced. They are, they're able to experience deeply the same thing that Paul is going through. So that even though like they're not together, even though they're not in the same room, that there's something that connects them. And it connects them because they both suffer. And the same thing is true of us is that when we, when we stand for Jesus and, and when, we, when we live a life that brings glory to him, that marginalizes us, that puts us on the outs, that makes people look down on us, or that causes us to have to pay something that we shouldn't have to pay, but our character's making us pay for it, that when we feel that, and you sense that warmth in your heart, or it's almost as if God is saying to you, hey, it's okay, I'm... I'm with you in this. And you're able to experience peace. It, it brings you together with other people who are experiencing that. It also connects you to like the church of Philippi because they too were experiencing that type of thing. It connects you to Paul because Paul too was experiencing that type of thing. And, and that thing, it, it only comes through suffering. Not only that, but what's happening through their suffering through their, is, is, is bringing them tighter. If you notice in the text, it says that they were striving together. That it, it says, the, the word is that it's striving together for faith of the gospel. And, and what Paul is pointing out here is he's saying that, that as you are being persecuted, it's, it's actually making you tighter. And as it's making you tighter, you're, you're more effective in helping the gospel expand to go places that it wouldn't normally go. It, it, and that's, that, that was what happened. Suffering makes it so that you realize, I can't, I can't actually do this on my own, but I'm, I'm going to need you with me. The, the picture that comes to mind here is one of a, of a phalanx, and it's like this rectangular structure and this is probably what they would have thought of when they thought of the striving together. And there's a picture of it there. And, and when, when you would fight in that formation, what would happen with the spears, and you'd have your shields up, and as you were attacked, it would just push everyone closer together. And what it did is it created this like impenetrable force that could not be stopped. And it, it, and it became stronger the more that it was pressed in. And that's kind of some of the picture there that Paul is pointing to. The more that we're pressed in and we decide to say, I'm going to keep going forward, 
the more impenetrable we will be as we are committed to saying, hey, I'm going to help more people know Jesus better. And so as they're striving for it, as they're doing this, then you see that what unity is also creating is that unity is creating in them this sense of where they, they don't have to be afraid. It says there in the text that it says that they're not frightened by anything. And just think of that in what they're experiencing. Their letter is from a guy who's chained to another person. That, that they, they're looking at a fate that is similar to the guy who's chained. And he's saying that you don't have to be frightened by anything. That there's something about community that what it does is as, it, as we're together, it helps us realize that we don't have to be afraid. I think about the, 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 the cave thing. That the fact, like, I'll tell you what, it was, it was scary, but it was a lot less scary because we had a group of people. And not only was it less scary, but like, after the first person went through and we realized they didn't die, like, there was a, lot, there was a sense of confidence that we're like, okay, now I think I can do this too. And, and that's what community does. Like, if it had just been me down there, man, that would be scary. But because we were all together, it wasn't as, it wasn't as, I wasn't as afraid. And what Paul's doing here is he's saying, like, he's reminding them he's part of their community. And what's he reminding? He's reminding them that they have a citizenship that's in heaven. That what he's reminding them as a part of their community is saying that you, your king isn't Caesar. Your king is Jesus. And if Jesus is your king, it doesn't really, like, there's nothing in this world that is going to ultimately be able to ruin you. That if you, if you belong somewhere else, if your hope is somewhere else, then, then you know that someday King Jesus will come, and when he does, he'll make it all right. Jesus says something similar as it pertains to fear, and he says this in Matthew's Gospel, and he says it this way. He says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Like anything that's going to happen to the church of Philippi can kill their body, but they can't touch the soul. All the pain they can have, it's all physical, but the spirit, like, they can't do anything there. But Jesus does say there is one to be afraid of. He says you should fear, fear him who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. That is, they're together in community. What they're able to do is they're able to remind themselves of Jesus' words. And it's that there's nothing that, that anyone can take from those of you whose faith is in Christ. That there's, we have something more, more valuable there. And, and all of this, all of this like bubbles over, all of this is revealed because of suffering. That suffering is revealing these truths to them in a way where they can know that it's, it's real and, is, and it's bringing them together. And finally, what we see here with suffering is that suffering is not such a horrible thing because what suffering does is it reminds us of our salvation. That what suffering does when we suffer for Christ, when we endure things that are hard on behalf of Christ, is it reminds us that we are actually committed. <laughs> Reminds us that we actually do care about this thing. You know, I, I see a lot of Chiefs read out there today. Like, and it's like, it's, I mean, it's, it's Sunday in the fall. And when I think about Chiefs, I, I think of like, there's, like, I, I really like am happy for Chiefs fans right now because it's been a long time before they were, like, before they were good. Like, they, I just, I, I, I know. And, it, and here's the thing that when I talk to Chiefs fans, one of the things that, that, I, that comes out so people will be like, man, I, I love it that we're winning. I love it that we're good. I'm Chiefs Kingdom. Mahomes is my king. Like, you know, I, like I, it's there. But there, eventually, as the conversation moves forward, there is a little bit of a sense of like, but I'm tired of all these fake Chiefs fans. Like, there, there, there's this sense, especially like the Cardinals won 15 games now in a row. Like, they're going to, all these people are going to act like they know who Yachty or Molina is, who had no idea. Like, it's part of what happens. And with Chiefs fans, it's like, it's like, I love it that we're winning, but I have no idea who's a real fan and who's not. 
Because if you don't know who Steve Bono is, you are not a real Chiefs fan as far as I'm concerned. But, but, but what does suffering do? Like, why do you know you're a fan? That you know you're a fan because when it was tough, you were there. That you endured all those losing seasons and now you get to appreciate the spoils of Patrick Mahomes. And the same is true with our faith. That what suffering does is it reveals that we're actually committed. Because if you're willing to endure suffering, then there's something real about what you believe. Because you're holding on when other people would let go. Because you're staying committed when, when lesser folk have let go and given up. And, and this is what Paul says as he finishes up this, part, this section. Look at this. He's talking about suffering. Suffering is a clear sign to them, those who oppose people who follow Christ, of their destruction. But of your salvation. And that from God. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw that I had, and now hear that I still have. It's really interesting what he's saying about suffering. He's saying what suffering does is it reveals who's going to be destroyed, and it reveals who's going to be saved. That if you're being oppressed for the gospel, if people are standing against you, well, then you know that if they don't repent, that they're going to be destroyed like Jesus said they would. But you also know that you, you're going to be saved because you're willing to endure, endure it. That suffering is a, it's a sign and it's also a reminder of the promise. It, and this is kind of where like, so... And this is where people kind of like, okay, look internally at their hearts and they say, okay, well, I'm not like really like sold out for Jesus, but I think I'm good because I'm not like, I'm not opposing him. And this is saying that the people who are opposing them, like those are the people who are going to be destroyed. So that's kind of like the mental game that people start playing when you start talking about this stuff. And to that, I would just say to you, have you listened to anything I've said for the last 25 minutes? I mean, the whole point of this text is saying that like, if you're not willing to like suffer for him, then what makes you think that it's yours? But even just to say that your argument, like take that aside, let's say that you're like, okay, well, I'm not opposing him. I'm just kind of nominally committed to him, but he's not like, I'm not really sold out, but I think I'm going to be good. And to that, I would just say this, that if Jesus, if like we really belong to like a citizenship in heaven and Jesus is the king of that, and part of his kingdom is to say, I have to be the king of your heart. If your response to him saying, I have to be the king of your heart, is to say, how about a prince? Then I would say that you are actually opposing him. Because you're not doing what he says. That if it was a country, that'd be treason. And so it turns the mirror on us and asks us to say this, okay, so, so where are we? And I would assume that most of us, though, we, we look at this text and what makes it really difficult is it brings us all to this question, right? Am I actually willing to suffer for him? Like, like that's the real question that this brings to all of us. And if the answer is no, then that's, this is actually really a scary text for us. And what we have to be really careful to do with texts, especially like this one, is not to talk about some type of persecution that's never going to come to us so we all can walk out of here and pat ourselves on the back because we're going to endure something that we'll never have to endure. But the question is this. When following Jesus makes your life not convenient or creates challenge, do you still follow him or do you find an excuse to not do what he says? Like, are there, are there people who God has put into your life where God has opened the door for you to share the gospel with? And your response to that open door was, nah, I think I'll just, I don't know what they'll do. If that's it, 
You know why you said that? Because you're afraid to suffer. Because you're afraid of persecution. Has there ever been a moment where you were in a group of people who didn't agree with your faith and they were saying things and doing things and it comes to you and you have an opportunity to take a stand and instead of doing it, you said nothing. Why? It's probably because at some level you're not willing to suffer for him. You're not willing to be marginalized And we do all the stuff in our brain, right? We we talk ourselves out of it, but at the end of the day, that's really what it comes down to. Are are there sacrifices that God's asking you to make? And your response to those sacrifices is, no, I don't think that's... Well, the reason why you're saying no is because you're not willing to suffer for him. And, And here's the thing, like, this is part of the deal, I'm not saying we should be weirdos who look for for conflict. I I don't think that's what Paul's, Paul was just simply living his life for Christ. And as he did, suffering came. And at the end of Paul's life, he wrote this letter to to his protege, a man named Timothy. And this is what he says, and it's it's far more direct than what he said here in Philippians, but I think it's worth noting. Look at this in in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says, as I close, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Like, isn't that horrible? (laughs) He's saying, if you, if you want to live a godly life, if you want to do this, if you want to know that you're good, part of that is persecution. Part of that is you will feel marginalized. Part of that is there are going to be things that you're going to have to endure that you wouldn't want. That's how it works. It's hard. It's what none of us would want. But it's not that bad. Because it reveals... It reveals our home. It brings us together. And it shows us that we're saved because why else would we do this if we weren't? And as I think about this text, there is like this really powerful gospel tie there in the middle. And, and this, is, this is where you see it here in verse 27. Look at this. Where he says, of your salvation and that from God that there is a reminder in the text that our salvation, that the fact that we get to belong to this heavenly citizenship, that it's ours because of what God did for us. It's ours because Jesus was willing to die. It's, It's ours. It's from him. And I don't know about you, but when I think about texts like this, especially as I study texts about persecution, about suffering. Like, I immediately feel like a loser. I think of all the times God's opened a door and I've missed it. I think of all the times where I should have said something where I didn't. I think of all the opportunities that I've missed and I think, gosh, I really, really blew it. But salvation's from God. And because it's from God, the beauty of that is that, that God, he doesn't, he doesn't look at, he doesn't save me because of what I did. He doesn't save me because of all the times I'm going to get it right. He saved me because he knew all the times I was going to get it wrong. That I don't, I'm saved not because of my record, but I'm saved because of his And that all the times where we mess up and we fall, the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is there to pick us up, to show us grace, and to nudge us forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And God, we thank you for the grace that you show us. God, we thank you that you are faithful and you're worth suffering for. And God, even as we think about that, like you're worth suffering for. And the reason why that's true is because you suffered for us. Jesus, I thank you that you were willing to die for me. That you were willing to suffer on my behalf at the cross. And so God, as I come to you this morning and I pray, I pray that we would all be reminded of what you did for us and that we would have a willingness 
and a desire to do the same. Jesus, we love you. And we put our trust in you. And we put our hope in what was done. And I just pray that you would help us all to be strong. Help us all to be able to and be willing to endure whatever might be thrown at us. Because what we have in you is far more important than anything we could lose. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for watching us on YouTube today. We hope that the content that you heard helped you know Jesus better. Also, don't forget to click subscribe and to click the bell icon so that you'll get notified every time our channel drops a new video. If you would like to partner with us and what God is doing here at New Life, there are three ways that you can give. You can give by mailing a check to the church. You can give by going to giving.nlspringfield.com or you can text 84321 with the amount that you'd like to give. And if you would like to connect with us in any other way, you can visit us at nlspringfield.com Click on the connect tab and we will get back to you as soon as we can. See you next week.